Hello and welcome. I'm Jamie Younger. Before we dive into today's show, I want to celebrate the fact that this episode is the exclamation point on the close of our show's first season. We will launch the second season on April 28th. We are so grateful to all the women who have shared their stories and experiences with us and with you. We are moving forward like a freight train without a pause and launching our second season on April 28th. I am thrilled to tell you about some of the exciting changes to the show. First, we are changing the show's name and also making some adjustments to the format. The new name of the show is If You Knew Me, If You Knew Me. We will start coming out weekly on Thursdays. And all of the episodes will be personal stories from women about their inner lives. Guests will share their stories under their real names, but also anonymously. And last but not least, the episodes will be shorter, something between 10 and 20 minutes. We are very excited and energized by these changes. If you're a subscriber to the show, you'll continue to get new episodes when they hit. But if you haven't subscribed yet take a moment now and subscribe. You might also check out our brand new website. And while you're there, sign up for our newsletter. The website is if you knew me dot show, if you knew me dot show. So without further ado, let's get going with today's episode. My conversation with Dr. Maria Sirwa. If you've had any clear moment of suffering, the loss of someone you've loved, loss of a job, loss of a home, or betrayal or exile, not being included, not being seen, not having your voice count, you know, any kind of suffering at all, what we recognize is that while things are breaking down, you don't feel well, you can't function as well, you don't know who to trust, life doesn't make sense anymore, your heart is hurting, your mind is clouded, as all of that is happening. At the exact same time, opportunities begin to open up to create life anew, you know, to make wiser choices, uh, choices that are healthier or more sustaining or just, you know, bring forward more of what makes you happier. Dr. Maria Serwa is a clinical psychologist and expert in the field of positive psychology. For decades, she has studied what makes people resilient I speak with her about what resilient people know and do that non-resilient people don't, how we can move forward in the toughest of times, and why suffering and happiness are intrinsically linked, and how that's a good thing. Maria, it's so good to talk to you. You've been working for decades as a clinical psychologist, um, and I was particularly interested in how you have this focus on positive psychology and resilience. And I wanted to talk about some of your earlier experiences when you were working in a pediatric oncology ward. You were helping children who were facing life-threatening illnesses, often cancer. Um, And I was wondering if you could just start off by talking to me about that work that you were doing, what you were doing, and what you learned from the families that you were meeting with. Happy to. It was incredibly meaningful work helping a family navigate a diagnosis of cancer or another blood disease in their child. And I happened to get assigned that year to the bone marrow unit, which meant that many of the children I worked with had already been through rounds of radiation or chemotherapy and it hadn't quite, or surgeries and it hadn't quite worked. And so we were looking to transplant marrow, which meant that the families were in a in a much more dire situation than children who were being treated in the clinic. And so I, I got to meet families at one of the worst moments in their lives and was astonished to witness that some families, even while they were incredibly distraught and frightened, actually grew. They actually became kinder to each other, wiser about where to invest their time and energy more thoughtful about how they showed up and what they said, and stronger as a, as a unit, as a system. And that engendered in me a, a kind of lifelong question. It's like, well, what do those families know? And how can we share that wisdom with others? And, and what do you think they knew? 
Well, essentially, they knew what we call in the field of psychology how to be resilient. They knew how to have difficult thoughts, you know, thoughts of anxiety, worry, fear, and also move forward in a positive direction. They knew how to feel exhausted and hopeful at the same time or worried and generous. In other words, they understood that in any one moment we have the opportunity to experience what we're feeling and not deny it in any way and make choices that help us move to a slightly better place. Yeah, I, I, in, in your writings and, and you've given so many talks around the world um, and you use this phrase that I find really intriguing, which is the paradox of being. You know, you talk about that our growth as humans happens in this messy middle of that paradox of being. Could you talk about what that paradox is, what you mean by that phrase, and how growth in particular happens in that paradox? Sure. You know, that's probably a phrase that I borrowed from John O'Donohue or or someone like him. Um, But it really points to the essence of resilience. A misunderstanding that some of us have about being resilient it's that, is that it's an either or thing. Either I'm strong enough to withstand the storm or I'm too weak and I get blown over like a broken tree, for example. And when we actually look at who human beings are at their best in the most difficult moments, we actually uncover that a much more apt metaphor is a metaphor that integrates both brokenness and wholeness at the same time that honors and respects that at any one moment I might be feeling distraught or angry or frustrated or just exhausted. And yet at the exact same time, appreciate that I have strengths and strategies and skills that I can apply to the challenge I'm facing. And it is this paradoxical metaphor of being both broken and whole that really represents who we are at our best in the most difficult moments. I mean, we're seeing evidences of this around the world in the the people in Ukraine who are, you know, fighting horror and yet being kind to one another. And in our own lives, like, for example, in the life of Sister Monica Clare, you know, her capacity to have this deep, hidden, faithful devotion to God, even while she was living a life that on the outside felt a bit not her, felt a bit false, right? So a deep interior authenticity and at the same time finding herself in positions that weren't quite her and holding both realities at the same time and over time making a choice that was more life-sustaining for her. That's what resilience actually looks and feels like. I don't know how frequently as a psychologist and you know, as a coach and as a speaker, um, you talk about moments when you have um, been struggling yourself and how the paradox was happening in your own life? Oh, so, so many, (laughs) so many (laughs) moments. You know, one of the most profound moments for me was a recognition in my early 20s that I had chosen to be in a marriage that was not sustaining for me, that was not healthful for me. I I got married right out of college. Uh, I remember the day the gentleman asked me to marry him. Out of my mouth came the word yes, but in my stomach, I actually felt quite nauseous and like I wanted to throw up. And I didn't have the capacity at the time to pause long enough to ask myself, well, why do I feel like I want to throw up if what, what I'm saying is yes? And just a few years later, you know, recognizing that this was not a relationship that I really knew how to help grow or that I had much skill in navigating the difficult moments, which seemed to be pretty relentless. And so that was probably the first awakening that I had, that there was a dissonance within me that needed to be paid attention to, and that I I needed to learn to become more honest with myself about who I was and what I was looking for, what I needed, and what would be healthy for me. Um, So that was a very young 25-year-old awakening. And since then, There have been a number of moments um, where I have learned more carefully to step back and notice, wow, is there something that I'm keeping hidden that needs to be expressed? In my early mid-30s, actually, I had young babies at home. I went on to get married a second time and 
pretty early on in the marriage, my now ex-husband developed cancer. And so it was a very stressful time, a young infant at home, a husband with cancer. And I decided to take a writing class and just to give myself an hour a week that was just for me and uncovered in that choice, this deep longing that I had had since I was a young girl to write and to be a writer. And all of a sudden now in my mid thirties, I was giving myself permission to do that and couldn't believe that I had actually suppressed that longing for almost 20 years. Um, I want to go back to you talking about, you know, making this hasty decision that was not fully embodied to get married to your first husband. Um, looking back at that for yourself and now also in the work that you've done, what is that dissonance that happens so often, particularly for women who are sort of being asked, right, to get married and saying yes when your body's saying no? Like, what, what do you make of that at this point now? Well, my understanding, for, I'll speak for first for me and then in general, is that I didn't have an internal compass or guidance system that enabled me to pause and think, oh, what wisdom does my body have? Or what do I really want? I, I didn't know how to put myself in the center of the equation. I was raised in uh, family systems and community and religious systems where I had somehow interpreted that what it meant to be a good girl or a good woman meant finding a partner, getting married, and sort of stabilizing life that way. I think of it now in my kinder older years as a kind of failure of imagination. Like not only did I not know to check in with my body and ask myself what I wanted, I, I didn't have a vision of life outside of young women getting married and, you know, finding, uh, like checking that off the list, that that meant I was having a good life. Now I understand and I think this is true for both men and women, that, that it takes time and, and a number of life experiences to begin to recognize that the people who raise us and the leaders and mentors in our early years are doing the best they can to give us thoughts and ideas and pathways that maybe worked for them or make sense to them, but aren't necessarily true for who we are and for what our spirit or our hearts, our bodies need and long for. So it often takes time to become sophisticated enough to be able to say, oh, that was their best guidance and it's not true for me and that's okay. And I give myself permission to go this way instead of that way. Yeah. Um, I know you've spoken earlier. I, I wonder if you could speak now about this relationship between suffering and I guess what we'll call happiness and how you see them as intrinsically linked in some way. Yes. Well, if you've had any clear moment of suffering, the loss of someone you've loved, loss of a job, loss of a home, or betrayal or exile, not being included, not being seen, not having your voice count, you know, any kind of suffering at all, what we recognize is that while things are breaking down, you don't feel well, you can't function as well, you don't know who to trust, life doesn't make sense anymore, your heart is hurting, your mind is clouded, as all of that is happening. At the exact same time, opportunities begin to open up to create life anew, you know, to make wiser choices, uh, choices that are healthier or more sustaining, or just, you know, bring forward more of what makes you happier. Interestingly enough, for most of us, it is those moments of suffering where this kind of growth is most easily found and triggered. Now, we can grow and we do grow in moments of ease and happiness. It does seem to, however, seem to be true that the poignancy of the difficult moments does ignite a kind of intensity and energy that kind of demands growth for us. Like, I, I don't ever want to be in a situation like that again, or I don't ever want to suppress my inner dreams any longer for the sake of a relationship. And that kind of passion and intensity seems to bring us forward to better places. The other reality is that even in the happiest moments, pain is present. You know, one of the things we found evident in during the pandemic was the awareness that many of us have a, a roof over our head and we have work that 
could continue to pay us even while we weren't, you know, in the office. And that wasn't true for everyone. Um, It's not true for everyone that we have the same levels of justice in our systems. So even while I might be in a pretty good place and things might be flowing for me, you know, if you have any consciousness at all, you're aware that suffering is present all the time anyway. And the reverse is also true, even in the moments of great, deep, dark pain, which is what those families at the hospital taught me. Kindness exists and wonder and beauty and generosity. So they are never quite separate. I'm wondering when you've worked with people who were in the midst of really, really hard times and having just come out of a really hard time myself, and maybe there are listeners who are in a really hard time at the moment, what on a practical level helps us when we're in the mud? So one of the things that we know to be true about resilience across the board, so this is true for across race, age, gender, geography, et cetera, is that resilient folk take the day. They focus on the day they are in. So in the worst times, we often can't think far ahead and we certainly can't imagine a better future. You know, we're just trying to get through. Resilient folk get through the day by making choices in any one day that actually work to support them. So one of the great driving questions in the worst moments is what is working for me And how do I do more of that? So if it works for me to take a walk just to get some respite, can I build that in? If it works for me to pray or meditate or journal, can I make sure to build that in? If it works for me to connect to this one person and not those people, can I give myself permission to not talk to those people today and talk to that one person? So it's almost like we we take the day we've been given and we shape it in a way that either calms us down or builds our sense of inner capacity, inner strength, or inspires us to move forward, right? So those are the three sort of pathways of resilience, strengthening oneself, calming oneself down, or inspiring and energizing oneself. And resilient folk know to take the day and shape at least a few minutes of it in a way that serves them. Does does that make sense, Jamie? Yeah, it does. And I, I'm just thinking how how it's interesting that humans do these things, I suppose, naturally. And then social scientists like yourself sort of observe what resiliently successful people do. And then they notice those things. And then we try to repeat them in other situations. It's sort of interesting. I don't know if you agree with that, that we figure these things out, not because someone gives us a bullet point of ideas, but Somehow the wise women and men of the world do those things out of, I guess, intuition. Well, sometimes intuition, sometimes someone outside the the person or outside the system has been able to reflect back to them. I was working with a group of caregivers of people living with a Parkinson's diagnosis last year. You know, one of the great struggles when you have a partner or a mother or a sibling living with a, a diagnosis like Parkinson's is that Every day looks a little different and things tend to get worse progressively. And so there's often a lot of tension in the relationship. And one of the, one of the care partners was saying, you know, it takes her partner who has the diagnosis forever to get dressed in the morning. And they, they make these plans like we're going to go to our favorite coffee shop or we're going to take our favorite walk and the person takes forever to get dressed. And so you know, she in her sort of impatience to have the good moment kind of tries to force her partner, you know, try, put this belt on or forget the belt or, you know, let me do your sock. And it just creates great frustration in in her partner and between them. And so after reflecting that that had been going on for weeks, she paused and I said, so is that working for you? <laughs> and she said, no. And I'm like, well, then let's not do that. <laughs> How about while your partner's getting dressed, you take advantage of the fact that you have 20 extra minutes to do something you actually might enjoy doing so that when your partner comes downstairs, you're ready for the good moment because you're in a good place. And it was like epiphanic for her. And so we then like literally, what could you do during those 20 minutes or that half an hour while your partner's choosing to dress himself? And she said, well, 
I could do my crossword puzzle, which I love. I could call a dear friend, which I always complain I don't have time to talk to my friends now. I could, and she listed like three or four things that actually would be positivity boosters for her that take the tension out of this morning ritual that had become so difficult for both of them. So sometimes we do need an outside person to say, yeah. is that actually working? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's that outside question. Like, is this really working? Because right. there's so many possibilities in this moment to maybe do something different. And and that is the hallmark of resilience, by the way. This is work by George Bonanno from the Trauma and Loss Lab at Columbia and replicated in many other places that resilience is really a flexible stance. Like what worked on Monday may not work on Tuesday because Tuesday is really a different day with a different set of stressors and opportunities. And we feel differently. Like I, maybe I slept well Monday night, but not I didn't sleep as well Sunday night. So what's required of me might be a little bit different. And th that so the other mistake we make um, is thinking that, okay, this worked for me in this crisis. Like this worked for me when I had an infant daughter at home and my ex-husband was sick with cancer, that writing class really worked for me. But at another time in my life, for example, when the pandemic hit and 85% of my business disappeared overnight because my business involved travel, when that disappeared, you know, taking a writing class was not going to be helpful for me. That just didn't exist anywhere on the horizon. So we need a kind of flexible approach to the day as well as a flexible approach to the the larger moment that we find ourselves in. I want to go back to um, speaking of this writing class that you eventually took while you were, you know, struggling with your husband's cancer diagnosis and trying to create more space in your life for you. Um, and this relationship to your maybe more authentic self, which is a big theme in Sister Monica's story, like what is it to be authentic? I was wondering if you could talk about what is authenticity, but also this relationship that authenticity has to belonging. So authenticity is the study of who we are, what's true for us, what values are meaningful to us, what our particular dreams and longings are. And it's, it's about the uniqueness of any one human being. When we, for whatever set of reasons, have chosen to not focus on what is true for us and, and put ourselves into situations that are inauthentic, it's impossible to feel like we belong. And in fact, many people talk about, I don't feel like I belong anywhere. I, I don't belong in that family. I don't belong in this job. I don't belong in this, this town. You know, the, none of those places or systems make sense for me. That's often a first clue that there needs to be a deeper dive into what's true for oneself. And conversely, when we find ourselves in places or moments where we can breathe and we feel, oh, I feel like I belong here. Like I immediately felt like I belonged in that writing class, even though I've never consciously written before except for homework assignments. You know, there was a sense of coming home. And what we're coming home to is a part of ourselves that is us and life giving to us as individuals. So in this, the moment of the pandemic, although it might have been interesting for me to take another writing class and I might have felt like it was an oasis, there were so many other dynamics to the fact that my business disappeared overnight that what was more life-giving for me at that time was actually to reach out to people who I think of as my mentors and say, God, when you have had things falling apart, what were the, some of the choices and some you made and some of the questions you were asking? So that was a much more life-giving, authentic choice at that time than signing up for another writing class. And in those conversations with my mentors, I was reminded again, oh, yes, there are relationships in which I feel like I fully belong. I'm fully seen, fully validated, and I can rest here. So that sense of resting and being in a familiar self-life-giving place are really hallmarks of resilience. We are listening to my interview with Maria Sewa. I wanted to break in and let you know that Maria has made an exclusive video for monthly members of this show where she shares down-to-earth daily practices that you can integrate into your week. She points out three simple rituals that will help strengthen and inspire you. It's a really powerful offering. 
I invite you to join us. You can find the link to her video in the show notes. Now back to my interview with Maria. I'm thinking about how hard it is to figure out who your authentic self is when there's been so many coverings. If you grew up, I guess, in a home where you didn't feel seen or you didn't feel safe, and then you become an adult. And how do you even like uncover who you really are? And that it, th- that question of who am I really just seems almost maybe alien. Like, where do you start if you're in that place? Yeah, there there are a couple of different places to start, Jamie. Um, one is to start noticing, are you well or are you ill? Because when we are living inauthentically over a period of time, we often don't feel well. Like we're not sleeping well or our stomachs are chronically upset or we have a chronic headache or, you know, we're just depleted often. And so noticing what's happening in the body body is a starting place for some people. Other people, it's really about learning to be honest with oneself about whether you actually look forward to that or you're dreading it. You know, like, are you dreading going to work every day? Then it might not be your work, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So are you excited or happy or content or are you miserable, dreading, frightened, et cetera? That's another sort of check-in. And the third is to actually listen to what one says in conversation over and over again. Like if you hear yourself saying to your closest friends, God, I really want to travel or, you know, I really want to explore having a child on my own or I really want to adopt a puppy. And then you talk yourself out of that, you know, like start to learn to listen for the the language of what we want and long for and dream. And give that a place to consider that we might actually be giving ourselves a clue about who we are. Yeah, the clues are there. The clues are there. And then, of course, you know, where I actually learned to have a greater sense of true north within myself was through therapy, you know, having a guide. So a coach, a therapist, you know, the journey to authenticity often first involves a kind of chipping away of what's not true, right? Yeah, that really isn't me anymore or that was never me. And I'm, I'm ready to recognize that. So a kind of willingness to look at, oh, yep, nope, I layered that on myself, but that's actually not who I am. If we can pause and talk about, about that, to let go of those familiar, but inauthentic parts of yourself. Um, I don't know if you can kind of talk about that process and how we can do that with grace. You know, the how to do it, it it is extremely painful because it often means that some of the relationships, some of the places in which we have belonged, we can no longer belong to. In some ways, we, we are exiling ourselves from the groups or systems or individuals that we had attached ourselves to. So when I left, you know, that early marriage, all sorts of relational social bonds disappeared. And, and that's a big part of the terror is that we'll no longer be accepted or we don't know where we're going to belong now, right? Mm-hmm. And that's a big part of what makes it difficult. The other part that makes it difficult, which is ironic, is that there is a felt sense of energy, of life force, of kind of like water in the well that starts to emerge when we start saying yes to ourselves that can be frightening because perhaps we haven't felt that before. We haven't felt like, that positive flow of self-regard and self-esteem and self-confidence that starts to emerge when we say, that is not me, I'm moving in this direction. And so that can be frightening as well, this positive flow that starts to occur within us. It's a kind of empowerment that we feel and an energy that we feel. And then the third, one of the third main reasons why making authentic choices is frightening is we're not sure that it's going to work out right? There's no guarantee. So I leave my early marriage. Will I find love again? I make a decision to stop being an attorney. I'm thinking of a couple of women I know, stop being lawyers and become yoga teachers. Am I going to be able to make a living? You know, so we're not sure where the choice is going to take us. And the uncertainty itself can be frightening. Yeah, indeed. I keep having this phrase from Sister Monica's, the conversation I had with her, 
come back to me again and again, which is, I'm going to paraphrase her. When you turn to your authentic self, the, the people who used to be your friends, they were friends with someone else. You're a different person because you're emerging as your authentic self. And it only makes sense that those people, you know, aren't necessarily interested in the new you. Right. Or just don't know how to relate. You just don't make sense to them anymore. And so you've sort of moved on to a different tribe. And for some of us, it's difficult to have a bridge to the former tribe, if you will. I really want to give a kind of permission all around here. So permission to grow and evolve in ways that are more true and authentic for any one of us and permission for those we are leaving behind to feel the loss, you know, to feel the confusion and the loss. I'm thinking now of what's happening, you know, around the globe for those of us who are recognizing that our our gendered identities no longer make sense to us or that our previously understood sexual preferences no longer make sense to us. You know that it requires a shift and a generosity on all sides to be able to navigate that with, to use the word you used before, with grace or with ease and skillfulness. And I don't know about you, but it, it's taken a long time to figure out what skillful, kind, generous grace looks like when I suddenly decide to invest in parts of myself that have been quieter before or that are new and emerging. Um, certainly better at it now in my early 60s than in my early 20s. You know, one of the things I also want to shine a light on with your permission is that one of the elements of living a more true life is to accept that sometimes circumstances and sometimes our own inner conflicts put us in states of incongruence. You know, there are, for example, some of us are working work that provides for us. It, it pays the rent and puts food on our table. It's not work that we love necessarily, but it does serve us. And we, we might feel incongruent there because it, it isn't helping us perhaps nourish ourselves or grow, but it, it's providing enough or something, right? So authenticity isn't an either or kind of thing. It, it's more a spectrum, if you will, of trying to find a way into a life that's more true than not and more health giving, more life giving than not. And then the last thing I want to say in general in terms of permission is to hold ourselves in awareness that, you know, the choices we make are never just about us. It's also about the impact we have on others. It's also about the fact that leaving a certain work and choosing to become a nun or leaving one religious system and choosing another religious system or leaving a marriage and choosing singlehood, that has implications for our relationships. And I do think that healthy, resilient, authentic choices also hold in mind the impact that those choices will have on others. And that's where the grace and the skillfulness is so important, is to recognize that it isn't just about us. It is always about us and about our impact on others. Yeah, I'm remembering from our earlier conversation, you sharing this story about a Hasidic rabbi who was sharing this story about two pieces of paper in either of your pockets. Can you tell that story? One of the teachings in Judaism is an understanding from a rabbi who recommended that we have a piece of paper in each pocket. And on one piece of paper is written, for you, this world was created, meaning you are absolutely precious special, significant, right? And in the other piece of paper, in the other pocket is written, you are nothing but dust and ashes, meaning you're not special. We're all the same, right? Like everybody's going to end up in the same place. Everybody started the same place. We're all in it. And that, you know, the trick is to understand that we need to be aware of both teachings at the same time that yes i am unique i deserve my dreams my longings i deserve to respect myself enough to say this is life giving for me this is not life giving for me these are my values these are not my values this is where i come alive this is where i don't come alive we are special every single one of us matters and at the same time, as we are mattering, learning to matter to ourselves, to keep an awareness of the fact that we are never individual solo islands, 
and that the choices we make and how we make those choices has a tremendous impact on other human beings who also matter. And so at the same exact time, paradoxically, we are both special and not special. Yeah, it's it's the, the reminder that I need and I think all of us need. Yeah. Um, when I was um, in one of my darker times in my life, I went and saw a doctor. I had all these back problems. I had all of these things that you're talking about where you feel ill. My pelvic floor was tight and I had headaches and everything was kind of off. And the GP, she had ideas of physical therapy I could do, et cetera. And I was sitting in this chair looking across from her. And I realized in that moment for myself that what I really needed was a wise woman. Amazingly, through the creation of this podcast, I've had a lot of opportunities to speak with wise women like yourself. And I'm just curious, Maria, like being a woman who was in your 60s now and I'm in my 40s and there's this sort of 20 year span. If you can recall for yourself from the time you were in your 40s to where you are now, what have you learned about yourself and about getting through life in a way that is life giving? Um, I am so happy to answer that question. And I I do want to underscore something that your um, story, and thank you for sharing it, um, does, is a, a piece of wise guidance for almost everyone, is that often that gentle thought that comes to us like, oh, I, I don't need physical therapy. I need a wise woman. That kind of still small voice is often a wonderful clue in the direction of greater authenticity. You know, that thought that just comes in and gently places itself in our awareness. And a mistake we can make is to ignore that thought and push it away. So kudos to you for noticing and then following and listening to that inner voice that kind of just floated in. Um, I think some of the wisest learnings that I have gathered from my own health and well-being are that, uh, first of all, I can't do this alone, that there are wise people out there in the world in almost every kind of difficult moment that I could access either literally through podcasts like this or through personal connections or through reading their stories that illuminate a potential positive path and that it would be foolish of me and I think foolish of anyone to try to navigate difficult moments or moments moving from inauthenticity to more authenticity by oneself. We ought to take advantage of whatever wisdom is out there. That's That was one. And secondly, that I have a tendency because of who I am and and how I grew up to default when things are difficult to kind of a stoic posture because it kind of helps get me through. And I've learned to notice that, notice when I'm shutting down, just trying to plow through and not calling on help. So I've learned to notice my own default stance when things are hard and remind myself to open up and choose the things that actually make me more vulnerable, like letting people know that I'm suffering, like acknowledging the pain in my body, like needing more rest. So to acknowledge my vulnerability, and here's where the work of Brene Brown um, has been so important around the world. The other thing that I've learned is that human beings are remarkably resilient. We can look at any culture, any peoples, any time in history, And if we look with the right lens, the evidence of human beings who have found their way through the very thing that we are suffering in a way that actually cultivates a healthier living and a better living for all of humanity, you know, that that causes less harm and brings about more goodness. So for myself, one of the sustaining thread lines in my life when things are difficult or when I'm coming into an awakening that you know, what had worked for me before no longer serves my authentic self, that I can find a story of someone who's navigated that kind of moment or a similar kind of moment and be inspired and learn from them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, is there anything last that you'd like to add, Maria, to sort of the work that you're currently doing or maybe new insights that you've had since so much of your work changed due to the pandemic? 
You know, I just want to reflect back that one of the things that I gained in listening to Sister Monica's story was the deepening growth and safety and security and intimacy she was able to develop with herself and with others as she gave herself permission to become, to live into this thread of goodness that had been present for her since she was young, you know, this inner prayerful life. She finally gives herself permission to join a nunnery and be with like-hearted, like-minded, like-spirited people, even though every single one of them is unique and human and fully, you know, who they are kind of thing in all the quirky, difficult ways, as well as all the wonderful ways. And in hearing her story, it's kind of even with all my learning and all my practice, it's an affirmation again, a a reaffirming that yes, we, many of us, at least those of us who are not in danger of literally having our life eliminated today or tomorrow by war or violence or abuse, you know, those of us who are past that survival moment, we do have a choice and others have made similar choices and there are great benefits in making choices that really align us with our deeper longings and dreams and values and to keep in mind those potential benefits i think one of the mistakes we make is we look ahead and like oh you know if i leave this relationship or if i leave this job or if i make this choice that puts me out of alignment with the people i hang out with you know we make the mistake of only looking at the potential pain and suffering of that and forget to look ahead toward what, uh, what might be on the other shore, the, that we might actually find ourselves in a group of much more like-hearted, like-minded, like-spirited people who, who can't wait for us to come. You know, there's this gorgeous story of Shams, the teacher of the poet Rumi, who supposedly took his parents down to the edge of the shore one day and pointed to the shore and said, this is where you belong. And then pointed across the body of water to the land on the other side and said, this is where I must go. Knowing that along the way of that journey across that body of water, he was bringing himself more and more closely to those who were more like him and could value him. And so to to cast our vision, if you will, toward the other shore about who might be waiting for us to make the choice that is actually much more life-giving for ourselves. Maria, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for listening to this conversation with the wise and warm Dr. Maria Sirwa. We'll be back with the launch of our second season on April 28th, replete with a new show name, If You Knew Me. If you haven't subscribed to the show, definitely subscribe so you don't miss the first episode. It is an incredible, incredible story that you won't want to miss. If you've been listening for a while, you're probably the kind of person who is devoted to personal growth, whatever that means to you. If that's true for you, I invite you to become a monthly member of the show. We offer members ongoing resources for a rich inner life like meditations with internationally renowned teachers, exclusive book readings, talks from memoirists, and online events with show guests. You can join us starting at $3 a month, and as soon as you sign up, you unlock tons of special and unusual content. This episode was produced by me, Jamie Younger, and my husband, Pete Herkmans. We can't wait to share the second season with you and the first episode of If You Knew Me. It's called The Operation.